So next, we have Chris Thompson. So Chris is from the um, Members and Sales Relations Collection. For those of you that already know me, you know that usually when I'm standing up in front of a group like this, I'm talking about stories, storytelling, which gratifyingly has come up in a number of different guises already today. But um, I thought, no, 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 I've got to do something different. I've got to talk about something else. Um, so I can't talk about my kids. So the other thing which I can talk about, uh, which I like talking about, is, is maps. Because uh, maps are cool. Anyone else? Oh, there we go. So there's map fans wherever you go. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, the, the main inspiration for choosing this talk was uh, when I noticed this post going out. At the moment, the British Library are running uh, an exhibition about maps in the 20th century, I thought. And I tweeted about it, and uh, Alicia sent a little uh, kind of subtle uh, tweet out saying, <coughs> TEDx, just saying. Come down there. Unfortunately, I need to get the early train, so I can't miss it. But um, it kind of got me thinking, well, why is it that I personally love maps so much? What is it about them? tweeting about them all the time, uh, when I'm talking to the members out there, then apart from the first things like Digimap and, uh, and so on. Um, so I thought, well, let's, let's, do a, let's do a talk about that. What could I call it? Uh, I struggled with this one, and I kind of settled on something <laughs> a little bit like that. Um, the more that I planned it, though, the more I realized that there was actually something a little bit more fundamental going on, which I think is a bit more universal than just kind of my interest here. So I'm going to keep that in my back pocket for the moment. I'd like you to indulge me for the next eight minutes while I kind of get to that point. So there's a little bit of a, a journey to go through uh, with me on it. Now, in terms of one of the main reasons that maps play such a big part of my life, and it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, is that um, I did geography when I went to university. This is my, this is my degree. Um, and geography's great. If you haven't done it already, I spent the first whole year magnetizing you. So when you sit in a swivel chair, you automatically point me. <laughs> uh, but you get to do all sorts of things like economics, sociology, anthropology, geology, gender studies, and so on. It's basically the academic equivalent of a spork. <laughs> so you're trying to do all things. Um, and of course, we did cartography as well. I had a special set of pens, which was really, really expensive. And we did a module about, uh, about cartography. So that myth about geography being all about colouring stuff in, it's probably a little bit true, which was something that was picked up in a very understated way by the, uh, the Ordnance Survey last year when they actually put out a colouring book of, uh, of, of maps, um, which you know, I, didn't, uh, I, I didn't indulge in. Uh, but the main thing that you learn, uh, I think, when you do geography is about this, the fundamental nature of space and place. Um, you can no more absent yourself from being in a location, being in a space or a place that you can from the time that you were there. It's just kind of one of those things. And it's one of the things that actually, when Linda was talking about the Chicago example, the heat wave, that's kind of what I was thinking, well, I, yeah, absolutely. It was only when they started thinking spatially about it that it started to make any sense. Um, and if stories, <laughs> sorry, if stories are a method for making sense of experiences, the maps are a way of making sense of places space. And we make maps all the time. We're doing it as a sort of a mental representation of the places that we inhabit, but also the places we don't inhabit, the ones that we have to imagine uh, where we're, uh, we're not part of. And even when we find ourselves kind of off the mental map somewhere, um, the, the art of being lost is that you find yourself in a situation where you're having to construct a map from scratch. Um, out of context with anything else. And, uh, and the art is that kind of wonderful, kind of satisfying click sound you get when the new map fits in with the, what's it, what fits in with the old one. So that's all kind of a bit hand wavy psychogeography. Right? Uh, I thought uh, for this one, at least I need to give you some examples, particularly uh, when we're talking about, um, talk about technology. So this is, uh, this, is what, this is one of my favorites from a little while back. Um, if you remember back to 2011, Back to 2011, um, there was a major. This is harder than it looks. Uh, there was a major earthquake in Japan. If you remember, um, and this uh, video was put together as a, a data visualization of the seismic activity that's happening at the time, uh, based around uh, based around a map. And for me, this gives a really good perspective on, on what was happening at the time. Now, play this forward for. A... <laughs> So it gets interesting when you sort of get to 
the 9th of March. But what you're seeing is these little red dots in circles, these are kind of background seismic activity that's happening at the time. I don't hear the kind of little pick, pick, pick sound as well. So, 8th of March. So wait for it. So that was it. That was Sendai earthquake, and that's the thing that led to all these horrific pictures of um, uh, tsunamis coming in over the world. It's particularly of interest to me because at that particular time, my brother was working there um, for the Foreign Office. And yes, yeah, sure, you can show that you can show that information in different ways. You can show that information in different ways. But when you strip out the spatial side of this, you lose something, you lose a little bit, a little bit of that nuance. And I'm just going to jump forward a little bit over this example, because it's probably less interesting. But um, I just, we've had a little bit of VR, so let's talk a little bit about AR. This is bringing things up to uh, speed a little bit more. Uh, Pokemon Go, if you're not used, uh, familiar with it, is a game that came out over the summer enables you to use your camera and your mobile phone to uh, discover these little Pokemon beasties that are seemingly living in the, uh, the environment around us. You can catch them, you can train them up, you can increase their scores and fight with other people. Uh, and these, uh, these Pokemon kind of turn up in all sorts of interesting places. You can't see that very well from the back, that's at some week's funeral. Um, in fact, there's a whole Tumblr dedicated to uh, Pokemon turning up in Chapel's Rest. Um, you know, you've got to catch them all. Um, it's, it's what he would have wanted. Um, but for me, the augmented reality side of it actually isn't all that important. What is important, you can turn the AR side of it off, and it's still a pretty good game. The important side of it, of course, is the map that it's based on. The people that designed this were the same people that designed Google Earth. So you kind of get, to get an idea of its, its heritage. But it's the map that drives things like, oh, where is everything? You know, where are these Pokemon? Where are the resources that you go to in order to enable you to catch them? Where are the battlegrounds? Uh, and so on. And these things are generally clustered around points of interest in the real world. So the idea behind it is when you're not looking at your phone, you're actually getting out there and making sense of your local environment. So it's a way of using maps. It's a way of, kind of getting people out there and, and, and thinking spatially, which um, is great. Um, so I guess with about minutes ago, um, I suppose I better come back to that thing I was saying before, but it's not really being about maps. This is the thing that I kind of realized when I was, was doing this, is that for me, it's not so much the maps themselves, it's what the maps represent. And for me, um, they represent a link that I have going back all the way to when I did geography between 1992 and 1996. That's a formative experience for me, because it's when I first discovered, actually, that learning was something that I could do, and I could enjoy, and it wasn't just something which happened to me. And that is something which has kind of popped up time and time again in all the different roles that I've had. It's, it's an important part of me, it's how it shaped me. Um, and I think these fixed points that we have, because everybody's got them, people have been talking about them all day today, these kind of fixed points in our history, these transformative experiences, um, are the things which build our sense of identity, our sense of self, but also our sense of resilience as well, particularly at times of change. And if anything is going to be true of this year, JISC, and the people around it, 2017 is going to signal a lot of change for people. Um, a lot of people went through it last year, a lot of people are going to be going through it um, this year. Um, so my, my call to action, I suppose, for everybody, because all TED Talks have a call to action, um, is to reflect a bit on kind of what your fixed points are. What are the things, that, those moments that you've had in life with these positive outcomes um, that, have ma that you know, link you to your past, link you to your sense of self, and, and manifest themselves in some way uh, in life. And to think about those, and perhaps if they don't manifest themselves, think about how they, how they could. I mean, for me, it's about maps. Um, for you, it'll be about something else. But I think having that core sense of self and identity of who you are is one thing that helps us navigate through disruption and change. So it did turn out to be about stories after all. Sorry, not sorry. 